it, it is it is just you and me yes it's okay. it's just a, it's just the two of us yes hello, okay. and uh hello everybody oh it's just the two of us okay <laughs> uh, and if there were more people uh welcome to the children's literature channel of the new books network i'm mel rosenberg your host and today i have a marvelous author who author and sometimes illustrator who is uh, celebrating a brand new book so hello to Noah Nimrodi. Hello, I'm so happy to be here, Mel. When, when does uh, when does uh, the book launch uh, officially? Um, it did two weeks ago. It came out April fourth, and I so, had the official launch on the sixteenth this Sunday, and it was great. So so Mazel Tov, and uh, I uh, I heard I heard through the grapevine that it's been picked up by PJ Library, which it means has. that tens of thousands, if not more, of copies. Are going to find their way into the hands of uh, young children all over North America and perhaps beyond. And who knows, um, we might find somebody to translate your book into Hebrew. I hope. I hope. Anyway, it's wonderful. And, and, and I have to make a, um, a disclosure here. Um, and, uh, and that is that uh, your wonderful dad, uh, Dov Lichtenberg, uh, whom I sometimes call Dubale, uh, was my uh, and is my uh, my friend and colleague, and he was my boss and mentor at the medical faculty at Tel Aviv University for many years. Uh, we published together, we did research together, and uh, what a strange world it is that um, I left my lab coat to become a a children's author, and then found you, and I'm not sure that we'll be. When I discovered you, that I knew that you were Dov and Leora's daughter. Did I? Mm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I knew who you were, so I pretty quickly told you who I am, but from the last name, which is different than I don't think you would have guessed it otherwise. So uh, your parents have done a good job. Noah, come closer to the uh, come closer oh, okay. to the to the microphone if you can. Um, and uh, and tell me about your new book and how it came to be. And then we'll talk about your childhood and um, okay. all, all kinds of other exciting things. So can you hear me? Am I close enough? I don't want to be too close. But... No, you can't be too close. And show everybody your lovely new book. Okay, this is the book. I guess it's probably flipping it, right? Or are you seeing it straight? I don't know. This and is we're, not we're so all, shy. We're all, seeing, we're all seeing it straight. It's called okay. Not So Shy. And of course, shy in Hebrew is a girl and a boy's name. So um, go ahead. Okay, so Not So Shy follows 12-year-old Shy. The spelling is S-H-A-I, but it's pronounced Shy. So, and actually I stole the name from my middle daughter, whose name is also Shy, but it was just too good and lended itself to everything that's happening. And with her permission, I stole her name for this and a lot of other characteristics and little truths that are in there. So the book is mainly fictional. It follows 12-year-old Chai who moves from Israel to San Diego and has to navigate all the challenges and uh, adversities. She faces anti-Semitism. She has just, you know, it's a coming of age fish out of water story. So everything that comes with it and on top of that, the language, the culture and all that good stuff. Uh and it's a it's a slice it's a, it's a so-called fictional slice of life, but it does remind me a little bit of your childhood somehow. Yes, it does. That is not probably not accidental. As I started writing the book, I was I thought I was the mom in the story, and I was lending from my children's experiences since I I was I moved back and forth from my father's job, as you know. Uh, twice. So I had two years in the States and back in Israel and two years in the States again and back in Israel by the age of 12. So, so and, 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 and we should say that your, your father studied oxidation, not of avocados, and you stole that idea from your husband. Um, I, I, I read the book with, with a lot of enthusiasm and satisfaction, but I was always trying to figure out who is, who is your mother-in-law? Who is this? Is that your mommy? Is are you the mommy? 
<laughs> yeah, I hope only people that know me would do that. Others would just dive into the story and not look for, you know, truths and falsehoods. No, the, 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 the story is great. And uh, as a, you know, I'm not a big maven of, of a middle grade, but uh, I really did enjoy reading it. And, uh, and you come through with a lot of humor, um, sometimes wry humor, which um, is part of the genetics of your family. Um, and and a love of humanity and and, and generosity of spirit. Um, so, tell us uh, tell us more. How did the book happen? You you are you were a picture book author. What what what's going on? Exactly. Yes, I I asked the same thing because I was writing picture books and my critique group was seeing picture books. And then one day I had a really high fever. Actually, I was I was very sick. I usually don't get such a high fever and in that feverish state I somehow became that child that is on the floor hugging the leg of the dining room table that was shy when we left Israel and the story just came to me I started writing it and after it was written I'm not maybe this is not that bad I'll send it out to my critique group we were just sending pages out the fever was gone and I was reading it and I'm like okay, it might be something, it might not, but their reaction was so overwhelmingly positive. And they all said, this is your genre, this is what you should be writing, this is middle grade. And I just went for it and kept on writing it. And it's not as easy as it sounds because like tons of revisions and telling the story from different angles and starting at different points in the story. But yeah, as I dug in and wrote it, I understood that a lot of it is me and not necessarily my kids. So, and I think in your critique group we also have somebody who connected us. Um, no, I think she's in the, my agents group. Actually, we share the same agent, B. Birdsong, and then you also interviewed my agent, Melissa, my wise and wonderful agent, a few weeks it's ago. A, absolutely, it was a great interview. Uh, give her my give her my regards. Yes, so uh, we can we connect on several uh, levels. Yes. Um, so you you previously published several books in Israel in Hebrew. Um, can you show the um, watching viewers just a, a little bit of your previous books? Okay, this is a story about a giraffe. It was published in two thousand four, and this is the porcupine who wanted pretzels. Who I I have to say I also illustrated, but I'm very, I'm not too proud of those illustrations. Came out in 2006 by Koim, is the publisher. Okay, so um, so now, so we have Noah who wrote picture books, and then we now have Noah who published a middle grade. And as I can, I cannot imagine myself writing a middle grade. I'm like a five-year-old. Uh, aren't you a five-year-old? What happened to you? See, I'm a split personality. I, I, you always have this question about your age and the age you're writing to. And actually, for me, it fits perfectly because both those ages that I had those moves from Israel to the States and back, one was four to six, which is picture books, and the other was 10 to 12, which is middle grade. So I'm kind of both of them, you know? Those are years that I went through stuff that wasn't easy and you know kind of made me who I am today and is kind of still living within me in a way so, so of the of of, uh, of the trips where my boss Tov Lichtenberg went on a sabbatical uh, yes. which was more difficult for you the four to six or the ten to twelve I think the four to six I probably hardly remember I I remember probably from stories that I was told that I didn't speak at first for a few months and there is a character in the book also that doesn't speak and then and also we came when we came to the states it was just me and my sister two years later coming back to Israel we were four of us already so I was just a little over five when I already had four siblings siblings and moving back and forth so that does something to your psyche I think as a child looking back so and the second the... time um I think the hardest was coming back to Israel because we left Jerusalem and we came back to Tel Aviv which in and of itself is a difference you know moving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv with Virginia in between two years is was also 
not easy in those teenage years. So, um, so with all this angst in your briefcase, you probably said to yourself, well, when I have children, I'm never going to take them out of Israel. I'm going to raise them so they won't have this angst of ending up in the States like I did. Uh, and uh, where are you now? Yes, I'm in San Diego, and I did say that, and I did promise that to myself, and I did, as you know, broke that promise. <laughs> uh, I remember saying that we'll do this, but we'll do it the right way, and we'll come back to the same place we left. I remember to talking to my sister, Ronit, before we left, and she also said, promise me when you come back, you come back to the same place. I'm like, yeah, we're keeping the house, we're, the kids are gonna go back to the same school, it's all going to be because I was thinking, OK, part of the trauma was coming back to a different place. So we said, OK, two years, we'll give them the experience, new language, new culture. We'll do it two years and come back to Israel. And it's been 14 years. So, yep. Let's, uh, let's now talk about uh, the book. Um, the girl in the book, let's say it's you. She goes through um, several major things. Can you can you mention them, and 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 why these were important to you when you crafted the, the uh, story? Okay, so let me see if I'm following you on what you mean. You mean that at first she really just wants to go back to Israel. She just thinks up every possible way she's going to go back with. Saba and Safta, her grandparents, when they come back, she hears of this competition, drawing competition, where the first prize is a flight to anywhere in the world, and she thinks she's going to do that. So there's a lot of resistance. And, and she, 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 win, she wins the consolation prize. Ooh, a spoiler. You just spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Um, so, yeah, and then I think bit by bit, she starts realizing that she can make friends in another place, that there are advantages. There's also, she's very angry at her dad when the story starts and towards the end, she is off, she makes peace with him. So there's a lot in her character development, let's call it, that she goes through beginning to end. Um, also, uh, she fancies a kid in her class and, um... And uh, there's another boy who's anti-Semitic, uh, Pat. Um, so, so why why is this part of the book? Why is anti-Semitism part of the story? Um, I think it's a very important part of the story. Not only is it a part of the story, but I think it's and and unfortunately, it's a very relevant part of the story because there is a big rise in anti-Semitism, and I think this is something that should be discussed. And I think. Kids need to see it happening to a character in a book because if it happens to them, they are better equipped to deal with it. It's not something that I set out to do. I didn't say, okay, now I'm gonna educate kids about anti-Semitism. But once that scene was in, I knew it was important. And also revising with my agent, there were stuff that we put more emphasis on it and later with the editor. So this was, an Another thing I'll say is that the incident that does happen, it's based on a true story. And this really did happen to my daughter, Shai, this, the incident that we're talking about. And Shai at the time did not talk about it. She did not tell us about it. She told us much, much later, probably a year later, when it was already, you know, the kid was not. It, it, we couldn't do anything about it when she did. Open but the same, the same story of of uh, of handing her a, 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 a yes. Jewish star like the Nazi. Yeah, yes, that happened to Shai, and so and I'm thinking if Shai had that a book like this when she was going through it, it would have given her maybe the strength to speak speak up like the fictional Shai does in the story. Okay, and uh, by the end of the story. Uh... Shy, who, who comes into the book being, to a certain extent, shy, uh, grows, and at the end, she's not so shy. Uh, how, does, how does that happen? I think she never was shy to start with in Israel. But 
And in, in, in Hebrew, shy means gift. And she was raised up thinking she's a gift and everything in her life was perfect. But then when she came to America, she said, maybe here I am shy. Maybe I have a different personality when I'm here. So she, she was looking for herself and who she is in this new place. And by the end of the book, she realizes she can still be the same person, even though she's not in the same place if that answers your question. Of course it does. It's your book, dear. <laughs> um, okay, now let's go back to your, um, to your writing career. Um, you know, you landed one of the best agents there is. Um, how, did, how did that happen? So, uh, you know and and not, not, not a little jealousy on my part in asking that question. Um, <laughs> we, had a, we had a wonderful interview. Yes. How did you find you know, Melissa said, Edwards? You know what? Uh, when you're when you're at that phase when you're looking for an agent, it's a whole job in and of itself. It's 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 work. It's a mission. It's not just writing that perfect query letter and synopsis and everything that goes into that letter and then pressing send all and sending it to all the agents in the world, hoping someone will like it. Because you know the odds are so low that you might be tempted to say, okay, whoever wants to pick it up, I'm, I'm giving it to them. And no, do not do that. It's, it's better to have, I mean, it's worse having no agent than having a bad agent. And you really have to research and see who you're sending it out to. You have to tailor your, your query letter to that specific agent. So it's borderline stalking them, learning who they are, researching what they like, who they represent, and really doing all that work. And when I was doing that, there's a website called Manuscript Wishlist. I don't know if you are aware of it. And I read Melissa's Manuscript Wishlist, and it said something along the line of she is looking for middle grade, that is, there is a Jewish character who is like secular Jewish and middle grade that is not about the Holocaust, but about contemporary lives. And so I don't remember the exact wording of it, but I remember reading it and saying, okay, this describes my book. And that's how it happened. She asked for more pages and eventually it came to the offer. And um, how did you sell it to Carbon? So that is Melissa's doing, you know, she submitted to editors and and that part, she was the one dealing with rejections and submissions and all that. And uh, you know, Joni uh, Zussman has also been on the uh, on the show. So oh, I've got, really? I, I've interviewed everybody except you, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, so that's wonderful. Um, I want to go back now to your career as an Israeli author. So you had two picture books out in the early 2000s, uh, one of which you illustrated. Um, and that's also a one in a 1,000 uh, chance. So, so how did that happen in Israel? In Israel, we don't have agents for the most part. You just submit to a publishing house. Yeah, in Israel, I didn't know what I was doing. I think it was just, I, I didn't, I wasn't a member of SCBWI at that point, which I think is very important to anyone who writes for kids. And I wrote a story about a giraffe and I send it out just as I said not to do. I mass send it out in it. And Israel, I think at that time, there was like a little fee that you pay, a reading fee and you just send out by mail. It wasn't even email. It was like printing it and putting it into envelopes and sending it and Koim picked it up. So, that happened. I did. I probably was not even aware of how lucky I am when it did happen. So, um, lucky is is a, a funny word. Let, let's say um, gifted. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a, a mix of a lot of things. But, so, so um, Noah, that 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 begs the question. Um, you know, most 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 people cannot. Um, segue from from picture books to middle boy middle grade to young adult um i've certainly toyed 
with the idea of writing middle grade. And, and I, I get stuck after 500 words because that, that's the limit when you're writing picture books, right? Um, and you have now been able to publish in both worlds. That's, that's really miraculous. Um, but what about your picture book career? That is much harder to write than middle grade. Much harder. Putting it all in 500 words, having, you know, the character, the arc, the plot, the, the re-readability, because picture books, right, you want people to read again and again and again. And it's so much tougher in a way. You have less words to say, to tell a story. So I am still struggling with that. I am writing picture books, but there's nothing, there's there are no bites, you know. Picture books are a hard sell and they're very hard to write. Very hard to write. People think because they're easy to read, they're easy to write. There's that is so not true. Okay, and, so um, we, we need to have a self help community, you and me. Um, I'll get you back into the picture book mode and uh, you'll teach me how to write a middle grade because, like, like you say, there's more of a I wouldn't say there's more of a market for middle grade, but um, funnily enough, I think your chances are a bit greater. I think so too. And, and there's another thing. Um, when you write a middle grade um, and you've revised it and you've shown it to your critique group and it goes out on submission, um, you know, maybe except for the cover art, what the book is going to be like. And when you try and sell a picture book, it's like it's like selling a painting without the painting. I don't know how to how to say it any better. Um, you, you're selling a frame, and like you you're, you're telling somebody, whether it's the agent or the editor, uh, this is what's going to be in the frame. But what counts afterwards is the picture. And 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 you're an illustrator. Wow. Let's talk about that too. Yeah, but you know what? The market is so competitive and there are so many great illustrators out there. I don't feel that I'm at that level. So that but, but, that also gets me stuck because I, I want to be illustrating my own picture books on the one hand. And on the other hand, I know maybe somebody else would do a better job at it. So it's that tug of war between do I illustrate it, do I surrender and just do the words. And, and a lot of times I think I'm, I think in pictures because I'm a very visual person. So a lot of times the story starts with the character or with the visual and then the words come. So it's playing like a movie in my mind. So I'm, I'm seeing it. So um, are you writing these days picture books or another middle grade? I'm working on another you, you have a you have a secret that some something going on that's secret, right? Um, well, I'm working on a middle grade, but if I try to tell you what it's about, it's, you're gonna lose me at some point because it, it's all over the place at this point. It's closed door. So yeah, we're not gonna talk about that, but it's a middle grade, and there are picture books that I've set aside and I'm sure I will come back to. Because um, I don't know regarding uh, Melissa Edwards, but many other agents are actively looking for, they're not looking for authors of picture books, they're for looking for author illustrators. Uh, according to Melissa, it's because they make twice as much money or even more. Um, and, uh, and you could fit that bill. Um, yes, I... I probably could, but I have to put a lot more work into my career as an illustrator to bring it up to the level, I think. That's how um, Okay, so let's now talk about your best advice for uh, young and aspiring authors like me. Oh, wow, that's a big one. Should have thought of that in advance, give you like my best advice. Think? Just give it, you know, extemporaneous is best. Yeah, it would probably be never give up, which sounds very cliche and very, and very, you know, just simple. But I think it's key not to give up. 
So one second, from, 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 2000, from 2000 to whenever you, you found Melissa, you didn't give up? That's about 18 years there. Yeah, well... You never, you never gave up your dreams? If, if you give up, pick yourself up. And when I say this is my advice to you, doesn't mean I necessarily followed my own advice, right? But you should, I mean, you, there are going to be ups and downs. It's a process of ups and downs. This whole publishing world, it's, it's always ups and downs. Okay. When so you're, when uh, you're well, down, remember yourself, remind yourself that the up is, is coming. Okay. I, I, I hope that you, uh, you got a, um, some uh, uh, upfront advance from, from Carbon, but uh, we both know that authors don't live on these advances um, unless they're uh, very famous. Um, what else do you do during the, uh, the day? So I try to focus on writing and I'm lucky enough to have, uh, to, ha to have the ability to do that, to have my husband be the one who is, you know, making the money in the family. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it, is, it is important. It's hard to, you know, have a day job and then come home and with the kids and whatever and the dog and the, uh, and then to say, okay, now I'm going to write for six hours. Yeah, um, it was harder with the kids. I don't have that excuse anymore now that I'm an empty nester. Okay, but you know, you have uh, so you have the economic ability, and you have the the um, the ability as a writer, and uh, you have a, a wonderful trajectory now with a um, with a great uh, agent and uh, great stories. Um, I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Um, and uh, before we, uh, we say goodbye, I have to ask you how the people in your family took to this story, because, you know, um, I'm a friend of the family. Uh, I'm sure that the daddy and mommy and your siblings and kids are looking for signs throughout the book. Oh, this is me. This is aunt so-and-so. This is this grandmother and that grandmother. Yeah, to a certain extent, it does happen. And I'll just tell a little anecdote that I like telling that Shai did have an older brother in the story. I have three kids and Shai is the middle child and the fictional Shai only has a younger sister. You've broken up for a second. Oh, oops. Hold when on a second, did I Noah. Break up? You broke up for a second. And now I have you frozen on my screen. Can you hear me? It's a, a, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yeah, you were frozen. Okay. So I'm unfrozen. Um, back on. Yeah. yeah. I can, can you talk about the, uh, the family reading your book? Yeah. So I'm just going to talk about, not about the characters that are there, but about the one that isn't, which is my son. And in the very early uh, stages of the writing, Shai did have, like in real life, an older brother and a younger sister. And in the story, she only has the younger sister. This was the tough part of what they call killing your darlings when you take out a character. I took out my first child, my, you know, my firstborn, and the <laughs> guy gives me a hard time about that, that he's not in the story. Um, but it did make the story much better. A lot of the angst that Chai now carries was on his character, and it did make for a stronger story. So not everything that works in life works in a story, in a in a book, you know. Mm -hmm. And the manuscript and it, got better, and my relationship with my son got worse. No, just kidding. It's it's <laughs> all good. He he. When he read the story, he understood that he is in there like everybody else within within the character of shy shy kind of carries all three of my kids somehow in and my previous in my previous life uh, i was a scientist and i also took my daughter uh, abroad when she was five and i was proud of it all through these years and then i read your book and i said oy vey um maybe she has a lot of uh, things to say about that that year so uh, how about the uh, mama and daddy uh, reading the book? Uh, how did they feel? 
Well, they just talk about being proud of me. I haven't yet heard. My mom has already read it three times. I think she's looking for me in that book. And I was a very quiet child that didn't talk a lot. Like, not like my shy, who was very chatty and a lot of, you know, stuff that's in the book, really, I think, was thanks to that. I, I got into my own 12-year-old self, but also I think I borrowed a lot from shy. So I think my parents are seeing stuff in there. Not everything has been discussed yet, but maybe it'll come <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure they will uh, forgive you. So um, this has been really wonderful. Um, I, I'm talking to you and I, and I, I, see, um, I see your parents in you and it, it's wonderful. Um, I have no, to say that Shai played the, 10 years ago, I don't know if you remember this, but 10 years ago when we were having the 70th birthday party for my dad, you and Shai were playing the saxophone together. Yes, and I, I can even tell you what the song is. Maim le David Melech. Really? I wonder if Shai remembers that. Okay, I think that did. I'll ask her. Um, it, absolutely. So I am, you know, I'm a big fan of your of your folks and, and your family. Uh, and this has been a, a, a terrific joy. Um, and, and for me, you know, like, um, because my soft spot is my sweet spot is, is picture books. Uh, and once in a while, uh, I have this opportunity to go outside my comfort zone and read a middle grade. And it, it's very edifying. And, and, and I really loved it. And I'm I'm positively jealous of you. I, I don't think, maybe it's easier for you to write a middle grade. Um, I, it's I, not I, easy by all means. It's super, it's very, very hard for me. I'm not a natural at this. I, it's very hard for me. No, but I, I you know, 15 picture minutes. Picture books are harder. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to remind you of something you told me 15 minutes ago. Yes, uh, they are harder. Okay. <laughs> Even okay. harder. No, I, 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 I don't think, like, for me, it's not hard to write a picture book. Uh, for me, it's hard to write a good picture book. Exactly. That's, and that's exactly what was on the tip of my tongue. I was going to say that. It's not hard at all to write a picture book. It's hard to write a good picture book that is going to be marketable, that is going to be loved, that is going to be reread. That is the hard part, writing a good, writing, and it's not even, it's not even enough to write a good picture book today. You have to write an excellent picture book, and that is what's hard, so I'm glad you said that. I, well, I could, I could just tell you, I don't know whether you share this angst, but sometimes I say, oh, I have a great idea, I have a great idea, I have a great idea, and then you run around, run, 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 and then you have your paper, and you, and you write down your first draft, and you look at it the next day, and you said, you call that a good idea. Yeah. I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. And even if the idea is good, then the way you're going to write it is has to be excellent. Because someone once said, said there are no new ideas, actually. It's the same ideas being told in different ways. So it has to be very unique, very special, very well written. Your, 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 your book about an Israeli girl who uh, goes to America and all of the things she undergoes is unique. Uh, and you have a wonderful voice uh, that shines uh, throughout the story. Um, and um, I, I was so delighted to meet you again and to read, the, read this book and to congratulate you. It was just out two weeks ago. So it's uh, called Not So Shy. And uh, it's published by uh, Carben. And let's take another look at the book. And um, and PJ Library has picked it up. And soon you'll have wonderful reviews. And uh, Noah Nimrodi, this has been a wonderful privilege Thank for me. And, for me and, too. And, and, and closing a, a circle of, of so many years. And we'll talk about your book next time, which is coming on Sunday. So uh, the book is being printed on being Sunday. Being printed on Sunday, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, maybe someday somebody will interview me. <laughs> and that I'm, was I'm volunteer. You'll have a lot of volunteers for that, I'm sure. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, anyway, yeah, it is very exciting. But this show has been about you and um, to congratulate you on your uh, career. Uh, and um, to wish you uh, 
All the best in San Diego, but come visit Israel for good I reason. do very often, yes. And next time, let's have coffee and, yes. uh, and compare uh, notes off, off screen. Okay, let's do that. So um, I have to remember to, uh, to say who I am. This is Mel Rosenberg. Uh, hosting the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And I have been with the wonderful Noah Nimrodi. And this has been a celebration of her new book that launched uh, called Not So Shy, published by Carbon Publishers. So Noah, thanks so much. Thank you, Mel. It was great seeing you. And I, can't, I can't wait to see you next time in person. Thank you. And my love to your wonderful parents and family. I will send it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.